lamb's offering. Amen. Last week, <clears throat> I was supposed to be here, but I wasn't. We you. Well, careful now. <laughs> I was in Florida with very happy that my son paid my way to go to Marco Island. We're down in the southern part of Florida where we had a family reunion. Now, the reason I mention that is because we went to church in Naples. We had a very interesting communion service there. And I just wanted to tell you about this communion service there. They do like they do here. They divide up. The families go to one room. Ladies go to another room. But the men all went outside. Well, the weather was nice. And I had my two sons. They were here back in October, if you remember. One read the scripture. He's not in the church today, but he was here. And the other son is in the church. But you know, a parent's heart is for his children. He wants to see his children saved, faithful. He wants to see his children in the kingdom. And so we had a very interesting preparatory service. As you know, those of you that come regularly, we do what Jesus did before he offered the bread and the wine of the communion service. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. You remember that. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does that too. So we do it in different ways before we take communion, which is kind of a miniature cleansing. And so this was the first time that I'd had both of my sons together with me. I wondered, what can we do? So I said, you know, I would like to wash each one of your feet. So my oldest son sat down, took his shoes and socks off. I knelt down in front of him. And I said, Lyndon, I want you to forgive me for all the mistakes I've made. You know, we cannot go around proud. We did this and we did that because we're nothing. The only thing that's going to save our children is for us to be willing to admit we make mistakes. And so <clears throat> I washed my oldest son's feet. I said the same thing for the younger son. Well, then we wondered what we we're going to do next. They were going to wash my feet. So I let each one of them wash one foot. <laughs> but we did this as a special service for just the three of us. So wonderful. First time we'd had communion together, maybe for 20 years or more. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to serve Christ, to draw close together. Now this, this morning, I had St. Wynne read the scripture and as you know, the title of the service is Vindicating the Character of Christ. Well, we ask the question, does, does, does 
the character of God have to be vindicated? That's an interesting question. The subtitle of that topic this morning is Are There Other Worlds? Now, did any of you catch what was in the scripture that Sane Wynn read this morning about the other worlds? Did, did you catch that? How many caught it? A few of you did. All right, let's look at it again, shall we? Hebrews chapter 1. Remember, Hebrews is back in the back part of your Bible towards Revelation. We're going to read verse 1. God, who at sundry times in a diver's past spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, in verse 2, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made what? The worlds. What the Bible is telling us here is we're not the only planet in the universe. God in his love made other worlds. Not only that, he made the angels. He made all things. God spoke to us through his son, Jesus. Jesus not only died for us on the cruel cross of Calvary, but Jesus was the one that created all things. Now we've had a, several times we've had sermons how the Bible says over and over again that Jesus was the creator. That God had Jesus do the creating, God the Father. Jesus came to this earth as a human being so that he could show to us that he understood about us and our problems. Does Jesus understand when you have problems? Some of you, I was sitting out front, some of you came to church this morning with problems. One person came with a sore foot. Other people came not feeling good. We'd heard that some people were sick. But some of those people got here even though it was later. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus understands how we feel. And he understands how we feel when we're tempted. Was Jesus tempted? What do you think? The devil was going to try to overthrow God's kingdom by getting Jesus to sin. The Bible says he didn't sin. Now, if you go back in your Bible to Genesis 18, you'll find that Jehovah, or and actually it was Jesus, appeared to Abraham as a man. If you want to go back there, we can look at it. Genesis 18. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Genesis 18. No, that's not. That's Exodus. Excuse me. <laughs> Better check what I'm doing. If it doesn't look right, might be the wrong book. Genesis 18.1. And the Lord. You notice here the word Lord is in all capitals. Do you know what that means? When you have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that means that's Jehovah. 
The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the door, tent door in the heat of the day. This is talking about Abraham. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And three men appeared to him as men. Stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground. And said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray, pray thee, from thy servant. Little, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of food and comfort your hearts. After that you shall pass on. In verse 6, Abraham hastened to the tent under Sarah and said, Make quickly three measures of fine meal, re-knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Abraham ran into the herd and fetched the calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man. He hastened to dress it. He took butter and milk and the calf which he dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Now here we find that Jehovah tells Abraham he's going to have a son within the year. All these years Abraham has been wanting to have a son. God had appeared to Abraham and told him his, his descendants would be as the sands of the sea. Well, verse 9, it said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. He said, I will certainly return unto thee. According to the time of life, in other words, nine months later, lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Verse 12, what did Sarah do? She laughed. Careful. Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. But notice verse 14. What does that say? Is anything too hard for the Lord? God made us, didn't he? Here, Abraham was almost 100 years old. And Sarah was going to have a baby. Unheard of. But God can do it. Well, Abraham had entertained Jehovah, and we believe it was Jesus. He came as a man. And it says in verse 16, the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And in verse 17 it says something very interesting. The Lord, that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I shall do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed for him. For I know him, parents, get this, for I know him that he will what? Command his children. Parents, don't be afraid to do what God calls you to do. What good did what did God call you to do? Raise up your children to serve God. Insist. Don't be afraid to do what God says do. Amen? Amen. He will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. 
Then in verse 20 it says, The Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. And if you know the story, the Bible story, these Sodomites were doing something that people today are being pressured into thinking is perfectly all right. If you read on, you find out that when the two angels got there to get Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah, that they wanted to have sex. The men of the city came and wanted to have sex with these two men that were actually angels. It's important to be hospitable because the Bible says that sometimes people entertain angels unaware. That's important, isn't it? So, God starts talking to Abraham in verse 20. He says in verse 21, I will go down and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it. And in verse 23, Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now he knew that Sodom, that Lot was down there. And that if God was going to rain fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, that maybe Lot would be destroyed or the rest of them. If you count Lot's family, there was Lot and his wife and his two daughters. And then it talks about possible sons and daughters, which would make at least ten. So Abraham started arguing with Jehovah, with the Lord. He said, are you going to destroy all of them if there are 50 people there? And God says, Jehovah says, no, I won't destroy them if there are 50 people. Well, then Abraham began, I mean, then, yeah, Abraham began to think a little more. He said, well, maybe there will only be 40. Well, it goes down from 40, down, down, down. And Abraham realized that he was dealing with the judge of the earth. So we're going to look at Genesis 18.25. Abraham said that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous shall be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge, that's Jehovah, he realized that he was standing before Jehovah. The judge of all the earth do right. Now the Bible tells us that judgment is given to Jesus. We're not going to go into a Bible study about that this morning. But Jesus is the judge. And here Jesus was talking to Abraham. Now the Bible says that we're living in the last days. How many believe that? All the things that are going on in the world, it's the last days. And the Bible says that we're living in the hour of God's judgment. Why is there a judgment? Doesn't God know who he wants to save and who he wants to will allow to be lost because they don't want to be saved? The reason for the judgment is to vindicate. That's a big word. 
the Lord before the beings in the universe and other worlds. He must make it very, very plain that God is going is doing everything to save every person that really, truly, honestly wants to be saved. Isn't that good news? Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. To Seventh day Adventists, this is a familiar text. Verses 14 on, we call the three angels' messages. The first message is in verse 6 and 7. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Do you know that the, this message is going to, that you're hearing this morning is going to every part of the world right now. Amen. Verse 7, what is it saying? Saying with a loud voice. It's not quiet. Fear God and give glory to Him. Why? For the hour of His judgment is come. Now, the cases of every person who has professed to follow God is being reviewed by Jesus. The Bible says in Peter that judgment begins with the house of God. That means that those who profess to be followers of God are going to be judged in these last hours of earth's history. So important then, isn't it? To have everything right with God. Says the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That's the first message. And when we talk about, we were talking earlier, uh, Norm was telling you, will you help us form six groups? He called them venues. A lot of times we don't know what a venue is. Six different places that we're going to be having evangelistic meetings. And who's going to do it? The preacher? No. Who's going to do it? You are the layman. God has called the, the how shall I say it? The average person that loves Jesus. And we have sitting down here some people that were baptized, what was it, two years ago? Oh, they attended the Revelation Seminar two years ago. Then this last year, they turned around and held a Revelation Seminar. And out of that group, ten people were baptized. Others were baptized that had seen Good News TV and so forth, and it enrolled in our Bible course through the mail. God is working, but he wants us to work. That's why Norm was asking for helpers, because one person can't do all the speaking in these five different, six different places. Now, I want you to turn with me to Daniel 7 and verse 9. Daniel 7, verse 9. It says here, I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. The Ancient of Days is the Father, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like a the fiery flame and his wheels as a fiery burning, 
as burning fire. And then there were thousands of people ministering. These were the angels in verse 10. And then in verse 11, oh, we're going to skip down here in, to verse 13. We find the Son of Man, that's Jesus, comes and stands before the Father, the Ancient of Days, as they review the cases of each person who's brought. Jesus is there to plead the cases. He's there to plead your case. Amen. If you give your heart to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to forgive my sins. If you say, Jesus, I want you to help me to be the kind of person that I should be because I want to go to heaven with you. He will plead your case. Amen. The books of heaven are open. When Jesus Christ stands up, when he finishes work in pleading the case of every person on this earth who has asked Jesus to come into his heart, the Bible says he'll stand up. I want you to read that. That's in Daniel 12. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the people of the children of thy people. Jesus is the one that stands for us. There shall be a time of trouble. When Jesus finishes reviewing the cases in heaven, the Bible says there's going to be a time of trouble that will come on this earth like nothing we've ever seen. We think there's trouble now, and that's signs that Jesus is coming. But this text says in Daniel 12, 1, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there should be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that is found written in the book. Don't you want your name written there? Amen. Then give your heart to Jesus. Let him plead for you. Let him lead you in your life every day. There's so much more to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. You might run over a little bit. That's why I go chasing around here. Let's get everybody together and get on the platform. Come on, come on, come on. Amen. <laughs> now God knows who's going to be saved. But he's had the angels write down everything about what we've done. Those who are found in the Lamb's book of life and have had their sins blotted out will be saved. So those that are in the different worlds are looking on at what's going on on planet Earth. Did you know that? But this judgment is vindicating God that he made the right decisions. It says, all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. You know, it should touch the hearts of God's people today that Jesus is today pleading our cases. When Jesus comes, the Bible says we're going to go to heaven and live with him a thousand years. You read that in Revelation 20, and we've studied that several times. But when we get there... You and I might wonder, why isn't this person there? Why isn't that person there? So I want you to turn with me to Revelation. That's the last book of the Bible. Chapter 20. And we're going to find out something else about this vindication. Revelation 20, verse 4. 
And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Who's them? That's the saved. Well, God has already decided who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Why are the righteous reviewing the cases again? To vindicate God. God made the right decisions. They're going to look at the books. You and I are going to look at the books. Why wasn't John there? Why wasn't Mary there? I thought they were going to be there. We're going to review the cases. Isn't that astounding? Now, after the thousand years are over, the Bible says, New Jerusalem, and we read that in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, will come down out of heaven. Just think of it. To this earth. And at that time, God is going to resurrect the wicked. The ones that didn't go to heaven. And the devil is going to say, I'm your savior. That city of Jerusalem is ours. We're going to take it. So he gets all the generals, all the great leaders, and he brings up up around the city to take the city. But suddenly something happens, we read in Revelation 20. God is up over the city. Jesus is there. And everybody stops in his tracks. And suddenly there's a motion picture going on. A 3D motion picture where the wicked see their own selves and how they've turned down the opportunities to be saved. And they say, along with even Satan, yes, God's judgment is right. The character of God is vindicated again. Now the Bible says that sin shall not arise a second time. We read that in Nahum 1.9. Nahum 1.9. It says, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. He's going to wipe out sin. Affliction, the results of sin, shall not arise up the second time. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that bring hope in our heart? We won't have to worry about sickness anymore. We won't worry about trouble. We won't need to worry about finances. We won't need to worry about the collapse of the stock market. God is going to bring all that to an end. Today, brothers and sisters, we realize that without Jesus, we're lost. But if we fall at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, please forgive my sins and be specific about it. Talk to him about it. I know I was wrong in this case. I know I was wrong in that case. If we don't be specific in the things that the Holy Spirit brings to our heart, it's not enough to just say, please forgive all my sins. We may start that way, but we need to be honest with ourselves. Amen? Amen? And say, forgive me for this thing you pointed out in my life. Forgive me for that thing. And if I've done something to somebody else, brother, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Amen. It should touch our hearts. To know that Jesus forgives us completely. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It should touch our hearts to know 
that sin will be completely wiped away from the universe. What joy should be in our hearts today over the fact of his wonderful love. He's so good to us. He not only died for us, but as we look to him every day in prayer, he will show us how to live for him. So you and I will want to share the wonderful joy that we have. That Jesus is coming again. He will forgive our sins. We want to tell other people about 